zwei. <lacht> It's hard to tell at this range now, but it doesn't feel quite as big as the last one. We've had, what, 440s on the bounce now. When I first stick this, I didn't think it was that big. Very, very powerful. Still down deep, though, isn't it? That's a good fish, that mate. See the big old pectoral fins then. <laughs> nice on Mark. Thank you very much. I like the way you strain them. A little blow. It's always a good sign. It's got a big old mouth on it. Oh, look at that in there. Look. Oh, oh, we wanted that one soon. <laughs> 48 bang on. It's a foul amount of weight, that means. Big spot, so big spot. Seven pound right, here we are at Etang de Pierre in France. And as you can probably see, the, the weather's absolutely glorious. Believe it or not, it's November. Um, we've come over to the lake here, prepared for hard winter conditions. At night, it's dropping, the temperature's dropping a lot because obviously the clear sky is losing a lot of heat. But uh, it doesn't seem to take long during the day for the temperature to pick up. I can actually feel the sun burning on my face as I'm sitting here now, you know, it's that warm. Uh, when we come over, we bought a lot of maggots with us for this trip. They seem to like the maggots in here, and uh, red ones especially. So what I'm going to show you for this little presentation here is just a few, few little ideas of how to present the maggots and get the, get the most out of your fishing at this time of the year. The maggot rig that I'm about to show you, one of the main advantages to it, is that you just use a simple standard hair rig that most carp anglers use on a daily basis. Just a couple of quick adaptations and uh, get the rod out there and you've got a nice maggot presentation on it. Right, so what I'm going to do is just put a tiger on. Simply onto the hair. And what I like to do is just bite it in half. And the reason that I do that, just to open up all the nice juicy innards. Tiger nuts are quite sealed on the outside but they smell and taste very sugary on the inside. I know a few people peel them, but I like to bite them in half. So once you've got the half a tiger nut on the hair, just take the maggot clip. What I tend to do is pick up a few maggots, put them into the palm of my hand so they've got easy access, and taking one maggot at a time, just taking the back end, thread it onto the clip, and make sure that you pull it all the way around. If you don't do that, then they tend to bunch up. So just one at a time, pull them right the way around to the back end of the clip. Now some of the maggots, where you're squeezing them, they tend to explode. But I quite like that, all the little inner juices coming out of the maggot. I know the fish seem to find it attractive as well. 
So even though this is a extra small maggot clip we've got on here, you can probably get about 10 to 15 maggots on, as long as you keep threading them all the way around. And one of the good things about using the clip with a big bunch of maggots is that it does create quite a lot of movement on the rig. You know, it makes it very, very attractive if you've got something wriggling on the bottom. I can always remember that when I was a kid using things like worms and stuff like that and catching plenty of fish. The advantage to using this kind of cocktail bait as well is that you've always got a bait left on the bottom. If nuisance fish like roach and perch tend to nibble off a few of the baits then, or if they take all of the maggots, then you've still got a tiger nut sitting there on the bottom, you've still got a hooked bait. When I've spoke to people that are a little bit wary of fishing with maggots, that's generally been their paranoia, so to say, you know, that they've been scared to, to use them. So once you've got quite a few on, just take the loop in the hair and put the clip through and then just close off the clip to make sure that they don't come off. And then what I tend to do with a half a tiger nut is just pull the clip into the bottom of the tiger just so it bunches it up nice and tight and holds the clip in tight there as well. And there you have it, very, very simple cocktail bait of tiger nut and maggots. And the fish seem to really like both in here at the minute. Red. You can hear it through the mic, but the old line's whistling in the wind. Broad old fish, isn't it? Mm. Very. Scales on that as well. It's a pretty one, isn't it? Some nice scales on it, so. Shows what power they got. Some just have got the knack of getting there. Whee! Well done, son. Nice one, Mark. Cheers oh, again. Boys, Thank you for the help. Big old bruiser, isn't it? Big. get in there, big. Some of them are getting them right in there, aren't they? Once they're getting all that maggot in it. Of that, that's a cracker. Big Absolutely. Swing. Right, if you're thinking about doing a bit of winter carp fishing, then you should look no further than trying some maggots. I've been doing it for five or six years now, and uh, I've found no better bait for creating some sort of activity in your swim. Even if there's a few nuisance fish present, you know, roach and perch and stuff like that, then the maggots will always turn them onto the feed, and the carp will hopefully not be too far behind. I've travelled with maggots as well, which uh, a lot of people seem to find difficult. How do you keep them? I tend to use these big maggot containers. This is what the shops get them delivered in. What you want to do is overfill the maggots and then pop the lid on, push the lid down tight. What I tend to do after pushing the lid on tight is just tape up around the edges. Right, when you get to the lake, the best thing you can do is leave the, leave the ones that you've got packed down for as long as you can, probably up to about 48 hours. You know, it, the ones that you're not using, leave them packed down tight there. But then after 48 hours, you've got to get them out. You've got to get them out and start reviving them. And the way that I do that, obviously this has been done already. So when you first open the lid, when they're full up to the top, It'll, they'll just look like a solid mass and look like they're dead, but they're not, they're still alive. And what you've got to do is take a scoop or something similar and distribute them to as many containers as you've got your hands on. 
This um, will obviously just allow a little bit more air and circulation to get around the maggots. Like I said, when you first open the lid, they will look like they're dead, but they're not. What I tend to have as well on board is some maize flour, so if they start to get a little bit sweaty, then I'll just add a little bit of maize flour just to dry them out. But as you can see, these are what, three, four days into the trip now, and they look like they've just come out of the tackle shop. What I tend to do is fish with hemp and tigers when I'm fishing with maggots. The reason that I do this is because it just offers a little bit of coarse in their diet, you know. Uh, the, the maggots are quite a rubbery texture and stuff like that, so it just helps to break down in their digestive system. And also, you get com classic combinations in bait. Like hemp and tigers is a classic combination, but hemp and tigers and maggots is starting to become something that I've really fished with well over recent years. Classic combination then, hemp, tigers and maggots. Right, just going to run through my setup that I'm using for, for spodding on here. I'm using a, an S range spod rod because I'm not going uh, big distances. This is uh, a nice easy rod to use for that sort of range that I'm fishing. Probably fishing about, about the 100 yards range. Uh, real wise, it's one I've used for years. It's the uh, Ultegra by Shimano. I've loaded it. The reason why I use that is because it's fast retrieve, robust, had them for years. Line-wise, I've got a uh, 10 pound uh, dollar sensor on it, which are cheap as chips, you can renew it because spotting it destroys it all the time. So, it's a little bit down in the line, but I'm not fishing at long range, so that's where I'd recommend having it for this sort of range. Uh, I've got a braided shot leader on it. That's sort of a 50 pound test. Nice and, uh, nice and strong. The reason for using braid is any, first of all, you're getting a smaller knot, uh, from your main line to your leader. And secondly, any effort you put into the cast, the braid puts that straight into the rod. It doesn't stretch like nylon. So definitely go for the braid in my option. If you're gonna use braid, use a finger still. Make sure the lever as well. And I've used uh, other ones, uh, which aren't really uh, practical for the job. If you don't, you end up cutting down to the bone. And it can not only ruin your session, it's very painful. So make sure you use one of them. Just to show you the spot that I'm using, it's a free spirit spot, they empty very quickly, they retrieve nicely as well. Uh, in, into this I'm putting a mixture of um, pellet, a little bit of pellet, maggots, a little bit of ground bait to bind it, tiger nuts and hemp. They're smack on for this sort of fishing. Um, we've had fish last night throughout the night and I'm just going to keep topping up the swim. I've been topping up the swim throughout the night, I'm just going to be putting a few more out now. I'll give you a few tips on how to get a bit more range. Right, what a lot of people do is they fill the spud right to the brim. 
Firstly, this causes a lot of spod spill. If I'm going for big range and I don't mind losing a bit of spod spill, I will do it because it's giving me extra compression on the blank. What you will do is you'll end up with about the top inch will come out. Because I don't want too much spod spill over here at this time of year, I'm only going to fill the spod approximately halfway, two thirds of the way up. That'll, that'll eliminate, just tamp it down a little bit, that'll eliminate a lot of the spod spill and it keeps it more accurate because all the weight's all forward. People that are learning to spot, that's why I would recommend that they do. You can see it's about just over half full. That'll fully compress the rod still because it's a nice soft rod to do it. A lot of people have it so that the, the spot is probably two foot from the rod tip. This is not, not practical for spotting. You're not getting a full compression of the blank and it makes it hard work. I'll only go for about half the drop. So where the spigot is, is where the, where the spot wants to be. This helps to make the rod compress easier and it gives you a bigger arc on the cast. If it does feel too soft on the cast, slightly shorten the drop, but what I mean by shorten it, it's up here. So have a little play from there. If I've got, five, I've got some big five pound test curve spod rods, I'm having the drop down here. They're very powerful, but this is a bit softer one, so I don't need to go for range. So slightly shorter drop. Right. As with the cast, so many people are casting dead straight. You're not using any of your body movement when you're casting. So you want your front foot, if you're, if you're left-handed, you want your left foot forward. Dig your heels in the ground, so your toes are off the ground. So from that's the starting point. Bring the spod back, checking it's not caught around the tip. Then all your weight onto the back foot. Let the spod just touch the floor, lift it off. Now if you watch my right hand, I will not bend it. Sorry, my right arm, my right arm will stay dead straight. All the power is coming from as I come forward to transfer my body weight, pulling the left hand in hard. So it's all the left hand that's doing the work, not the right. So you're coming forward, 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 forward. And off she's gone. Smack on the money. Give that a few seconds to uh, upright. A couple of shakes. Sorted. Crisp it onto the top. And away we go. As you can see, the spot comes back nicely across the top, skimming through. I'll go with Pete, he says 46.2. <laughs> oh, you're joking, Tim. Two right it is. What's that? Oh, that's good. That's a good shot. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I... Pete was, Pete was shooting through this grass here, so...
like typical fish. Okay, gather this mesh up. Just make sure no fins are folded. Scramble out. What a cracker. Forty pound twelve. Some Franz, third night on the water. This is the sixth fish, the biggest so far. About a 35 and a 34 are the next two to this one. It's a lovely deep bodied fish, no scars or blemishes, lovely fish. The air temperature, it's, it's below freezing, we've got ice on the map, but these fish are still willing to feed. And he's certainly not short of a bit of food. Right, let's get some pictures done. You awake, Pete? Yes, mate, yeah. yeah. Any chance a couple of pictures? You got one? Yeah, I just had a, a 40, 40 pound 12. Oh, that's one. Deep bodied one. They're all common. Right, it's a mirror. Rattle them off. Turn up again a little bit, that's it, isn't it? Just a little bit closer. The camera. Big smile. There we are. A 40 back where it belongs, back to its home. Lead shell shaking. We just twanged off a fin as well. Mm. <laughs> I was going to say it's worth getting out of bed for, but I've not gone to bed yet. <laughs> <laughs> Tough. What we got? Well, it's not as big as the last one, but it's a good fish still. Mm. It's just grown a bit from what I thought. A oh, lovely clean fish. Look at that. Oh, the hooks come out. Come out in the net, look. I only just had that one. Have one on the long hair? Yep. Yeah. There you are, thanks to you, that one. The peat rig. <laughs> well, I've got nothing on mine, I ain't got a little uh, added bit. Shaking a bit. 29. 29 and a half. <laughs> 29 and a quiver. Yeah. <laughs> 29 and a half will do, man. Well, we are 29 and a half. Cold November evening. It's just followed on from a £40.12. It doesn't get much better than that.
Well, thank you, Tim, for taking time out from your fishing to talk to us this afternoon. You've had an incredible few years, this last few years, on the French waters. How do you find it affecting your UK fishing? Do you still have the same drive in the UK? Are you more orientated towards... I haven't got the same drive in England, Sean, purely and simply because I run the mangrove and birch grove, you know, and there aren't two lovelier waters than England. You can, uh, you can rent waters abroad, you can, you can go on an exclusive group package. Uh, the difficult part about England is going queuing for swims or yeah. travelling to a distant water and finding out of nine swims there's one left that's no good anyway. So it isn't the size of the fish, it doesn't affect me in the slightest. I love fishing birch, I love fishing the mangrove. I go down to Chillum a couple of times a year for you know their events. Yep. So it isn't the size of the fish in the slightest, it's purely and simply the circumstances of the fishing. I love fishing abroad, I fish the huge waters of two and a half thousand, five thousand, six and a half thousand acres. You're not crowded. In England, most waters that I, I fish other than my own are crowded and I'm just past the stage in my life where I want that. Right, you've had some phenomenal success over this last couple of years with a whole string of big fish from different waters. Well, it's been amazing, you know, because um, it, it started out... I mean, I haven't caught an English forty. My, my biggest in England is 38 and a half, scaly in but winter. What a beautiful fish that was. Beautiful fish, lovely capture, memorable. I've only really fished for, for uh, um, an English forty once, which was at um, Orchid, yeah. when I was after Arnie. And Arnie died uh, at the end of that winter, you know. So um, from there, I'd started fishing abroad purely for pleasure. And it was going to Medine in the World Carp Classic in 1998 that just changed me completely. Yeah. The size of the place, the beauty of France, uh, the solitude of it all, immaculate. Uh, I fell in love with the big waters and it surprised me. And I went on from there um, on the big waters, on the small, you know, fishing ground. I love the huge waters now. I've been incredibly lucky with very big fish. I mean, I mean incredibly lucky. Like my first fish here was 56 pounds. You know, I've had four fish, I haven't even had another 40. But somehow, just now and then, these big fish finish up in the landing net. I've had 25 kilo plus fish from six different waters now. Which... I mean, that's an incredible achievement for a French angler, let alone somebody who lives in the UK. Yeah. I don't know if there's anyone else done that, is there? I don't know, I'm not inquiring. No. <laughs> <laughs> With so many successful carp fishing years behind you, what would you consider the major landmarks, the major highlights of your career? The highlights, looking back in terms of achievement, will be starting the Carp Society, um, starting Cartwheel. You know, obviously to have had seven books published in my own name is, is to, you know, you know, you start off, you, you don't, you don't even think of writing articles, and then you write articles, and it takes off from there. It'll surprise people. The major achievement and the biggest thrill of all was the second World Cup. Because to win one World Cup was just, you know, but you don't even think it's going to happen. You hope, you vaguely hope. But, but Steve and I went to America and we were making up the numbers, you know, at the field yeah. of 110 pairs, whatever it was, on 35 miles of river. On a venue you don't know. On a venue you don't know. So, you know, just to come up with a possible swim uh, and then to win the thing by the record margin that we won by, that was such a thrill. The realisation, I turned to Steve on the second day and said, could win this, Steve, and he said, I know. You know, and we didn't say, we didn't dare say yeah. it, uh, and it was such a colossal thrill. And winning the world championships, I watched Rob Hughes and Simon Crow win theirs, and it wasn't till they stood up on that rostrum and the national anthem was played for them in front of you. all the French. I thought, oh, I want some of that. Yeah. And of course, we won at Fisher Bill and we sang our hearts out with the national anthem. And that, funnily enough, that is the big thing that you want. I want to win this because I want to stand on top of that rostrum for England. <laughs> oh, that was some feeling now, that really was. And that, that will live with forever. Because Crowley said, Crowley filmed it. He said you were halfway to the stage before they made the announcement. <laughs> you know, because we're going to be up there with the Cross of St George and the Union Jack and singing the national anthem. Yeah, and both times, uh, in France, it was French third and second. In America, it was Americans third and second. You know, so like it was for Britain. All right, guys, you've got your second and third. Well done, didn't you do well? But we've won it. Mm. Right, how do you see the future of carp fishing? Do you see any major advancements on the horizon in baits, rigs, anything like that? I think it'll be uh, 
we talk about the good old days, but in terms of catching carp, you know, these are the good old days, aren't they? You know, incredible. Mm. I think some of the... Uh, what, what we're doing here, I've got to say, uh, and the magazines, um, they make carp fishing look very, very easy. You know, mm. the videos now and the magazines now. Uh, the waters are selected. They're the best anglers in the world going on these waters with the best methods. I think it must be very frustrating for the guy that you used to serve from behind the shop in Morgus the Trowel to, you know, to pick up the magazine. We went, especially with someone, so we caught 330s and 520s, and you think, what? You know, mm. What is that about? You know. Um, so in that sense, I think carp fishing is being slightly corrupted, if you like. Uh, it is still very, very difficult to catch carp. And we're fortunate we've reached the stage in life where we're invited to the best waters. Um, you know, we've got the best bait, we've got the best tackle. Terrific. I think for the guys coming into the sport, they've got to understand that there are landmarks. Our first double was a thrill, our first mm -hmm. 20. They're still both vivid in my mind. First 20, first 30, first double, all of them. Uh, and, and that is the glory of carp fishing not 3.30s in a day or 5.20s in a day or whatever. Right. That's a once in a lifetime achievement. You know, and it, the magazines now make it look as though it's an every week achievement. It isn't. So in that sense, um, it, it's perhaps slightly aggressive, I don't know. Um, carp fishing is a lovely pursuit and however difficult it is for you, don't worry about it. It, it is for all of us at times. I've just gone through 32 blank nights before I came here. Yeah. And I had yeah. that uh, 56 on the first, six o'clock on the first in the morning, first night. You know, so it pays you back sooner yeah. or later. Uh, but it's difficult to get this message across. Carp fishing is difficult. And, and if you find it difficult, don't worry about it. Right, thank you, Tim. And hopefully tonight, there'll be another big lump on the end. Whatever, mate, whatever. Next time, whenever. You're welcome. Thank you. When you keep back that distance and fill the frame, you get it, don't you? Yeah. When they come right up close, close to that, yeah. Just to get it all depth and feel. Yeah. 